Code makes the world smaller and our horizons broader. I'm John Shuchuk, Technical Fellow at Microsoft. In this series, we look under the hood at today's most dynamic open source software with the people behind it. This is Decoded. In this series, we talk about how coding is a lot like cooking. We talk to master chefs in the industry and learn about their approach to putting together solutions that can be your masterwork. I'm at Tavern Law, a Seattle bar that's an ode to the Prohibition era. Patrons came to the bar and they snuck through a hidden back door. Today, we're gonna be talking about the hidden code that's behind the scenes. We're gonna start from the last episode where we had a user interface built with Bootstrap, and we're gonna look at how the backend systems are created. Thank you. All right, so I'm here with Isaac Schluter. Isaac's a pretty amazing guy. He's the original coder on NPM and one of the early contributors on Node. It uh, took a little while for NPM to really get rolling, but uh, by 2010, it was already the, the default way that people shared JavaScript code for, for Node.js programs. And um, eventually, as the community grew, it just got to the point where I couldn't do it as my own side project. So we started NPM Inc., the company now that kind of supports the registry, and we've got venture funding and a couple of paid products that are helping to keep the lights on. Awesome. So last episode, we, we talked about building the user interface. We used Bootstrap, and that gave us a lot of flexibility. Now we want to connect it to the back end. So we're going to want some way that the front ends and the back ends communicate. When you think about building those kind of solutions, what do you think about, and how do you go about it? Um, I like building the, the back end as a RESTful API surface, because then if we ever need to split things up or scale them independently, it's a lot more straightforward to do that than if you build it as you know, one giant monolithic application. Sounds great. Why don't we take a look at some code? Let's do it. All right, so here is that front end that we talked about. This is uh, written in Bootstrap, very simple. We've got a list of packages over here, and if we select one of the packages, we can see the list of contributors. Now, none of this is hooked up. Yeah, this yeah. is just using some dummy data that we put in a for loop. And what we're going to go do now is we're going to go build the back ends to do this, and we're going to use Node and NPM and a bunch of other stuff to go make that happen. Sounds good. All right, let's get going here. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, I've got over here in my directory a couple of JSON files that I put together that kind of get us started. And the first one, probably the most important one, is this one called uh, package.json. Now, right. I just quickly created this thing with uh, uh, npm init. And that's exactly right. I mostly selected the defaults, um, but I decided to use for the REST package an important package. I said npm install. Restify. Right. Tell me a little bit about Restify and why you recommend using that. So one thing that's nice about Restify for building RESTful endpoints that communicate via JSON, um, it has this really handy uh, response.send function that you can just throw in an object. It figures out the content length, the content type, everything for you. It's great. If you do npm install Restify dash dash save, then it will actually go ahead and save that into your package.json. That's what we got here. here. Uh, and then the other things for, um, I know you like TypeScript, so if you install those and save them as a dev dependency, that's really important. And that's dash dash save dev. Right. The reason why that's important, you could install it globally to, get a, uh, to take advantage of those commands on the command line, but if a new breaking version comes out, now a new developer joins your team, they get a different version of it, and it's, it's a lot better to kind of keep everything localized and consistent within your project. Absolutely. So the next config file I want to show here is the TSD dot json file and all this is this was handled by one of these node.js development time tools mm -hmm. um, the typescript definition file manager and what this has done is it's downloaded off the web the type definitions so that when i go into the editor um, I'll get statement completion, I'll get type checking, and a bunch of other stuff over JavaScript, which really helps with, with making sure your code is right. Sure. There's one more part, which is TypeScript is going to look across all the pieces in the application. So I'm just going to type out more tsconfig.json, and that just describes what the files are. Um, and in this case, we're just saying don't compile the node modules. Those are there for, for things they are to what run. They are. Yeah. All right. So. That's kind of the basic ingredients 
for getting the initial app up and running. Restify is going to do a lot of the plumbing. Mm -hmm. Node is going to do the processing. And we've got TypeScript to help a little bit with the development. Sounds great. OK. To get started, I've just opened Visual Studio Code. Now, kind of a, an amazing thing about Visual Studio Code. Um, it's a package available from Microsoft. It's actually built on Node. Yep. And it runs on Windows, the Mac. A lot of folks are using this. Uh, one of the nice things is it's got integrated type checking and all those kind of things for TypeScript. And I have an open TypeScript file here. And what's what I'm going to do? I'm just going to import um, restify equals require uh, restify. And that picks up all that code that we just imported with those simple, easy NPM commands. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense, that might look really simple, but that really is the power of Node right there. Sure. I mean, JavaScript is just a massive and huge uh, community. It's an inescapable language if you're doing any kind of web development, so you may as well use it. All right, so we're using Restify, which we're going to use to process those HTTP requests. I've imported it. So now, notice with TypeScript, I get statement completion. I'm going to create server, and all I do is I say Restify. Uh, dot, and you'll notice I get all the nice statement completion. There's com create the server. I don't really need any options. And I've now got what amounts to a pretty powerful HTTP request processor. So if I wanted to handle, for example, a GET request, it's, it's amazingly easy. All I do is I say server.get. And notice I get the various uh, statement completions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, when I get a call for hello, what I'm going to go do is I'm going to write a function that takes a request, a response, and next, and we're going to write a little bit of code. Now, you just mentioned one of the really amazingly powerful things about Restify, which is all I need to do is I need to say response.send, and I can put anything in there. I'm sure. just going to put hello back. And that is actually pretty much all I need to do. There's one more thing. Sometimes people forget this, is I need to call next. So that actually, that next callback is, is really interesting because what that allows you to do is if you have multiple functions that need to be called for a specific route, you can chain them together like that. So let's do it. npm install, and it's a cool thing that we have all of those packages now described. Mm -hmm. So what this is doing is it's reaching out across the internet, pulling in the packages that we need, and as soon as we have those, we should be able to, to get this going. Now, let's run the server, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say server.listen. And we'll give it a port of 3,000. And that actually should be it. Now, mention that this was in TypeScript. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do this quick build step. And uh, kind of a cool thing should happen here any second now, which is we should be able to see the actual uh, .js file that we're going to end up using. And there it is. Um, look at that. All right, so let's run it. So I'm going to go over here to the debugger, and uh, let's launch that. We're going to debug this as Node.js. Now, I've got to do a little bit of configuration. All right. Up and running. We just created a REST server in just a couple of minutes here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to now check this in to our GitHub repo. And then why don't you take over on the project, and let's go do a little bit more coding. Sounds good. Even in a place like this, the Seattle Art Museum, software, the back-end systems, it's really what makes this happen. Yeah, people come here to see art, but each one of these items is tracked in an inventory database. There's lights to manage, security systems. Not to mention the website, yeah. the membership systems, all of that. Yeah, software's everywhere. So let's spend a couple minutes talking about great design using Node and how to create back-end systems. Sounds good. So I've gone ahead and checked out what you'd push to GitHub. Yep. Um, I actually prefer using Vim and, and uh, command line terminal. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, um, you notice that uh, I had you install TSD and TypeScript as dev dependencies. Yep. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add an init script here that runs TSD install. And that's going to pick up the TSD that's installed that's in there, my yeah. local thing. Also, I'm going to add a build script which does the TSC the compiler. TypeScript compiler, yep. Uh, and NPM is kind of more Unix-y than Windows-y, so it, it, uh, it gets upset if you get a non-zero error code. So, so I've added the, the or yep. true, so it can ignore that. Perfect. And now 
uh, when I run npm install in this fresh checkout, it's going to go ahead and install my Restify and TypeScript and TSD. So everything you need in order to go build a project, you get with one simple quick command. Right. So what I've got here is I'm adding a route that is for slash contributors slash and then some, uh, some package name. When you make a request to, to get slash contributors slash Restify, let's say, um, this is going to go up to the NPM registry based on rec.params.package, which comes from this, yep. this guy here. Uh, it's going to then come back with either an error or the package details. Once I have those package details, you can send what back. I want to do is go to GitHub and get the information about the contributors. So right here, I have the GitHub info equals package details zero dot GitHub. Uh, package details is an array of items. So I want the first one and give me all of the, you know, the GitHub info. Then I'm going to take this uh, GitHub API implementation that I created here and say, uh, for each of those, uh, uh, github.repos is the, the part of the API that looks at repositories. Yep. I want to get the list of contributors for a particular user and repo. And that's what we're pulling out of the, the package.json data that's stored on the registry. What I actually want to do, I want to add a little bit here. Uh, if I get an error, then one of the nice things about Restify is you can, uh, it has really good error handling. So I can say, uh, return next error. Oh, yeah. So anytime there's an error, you want to just, OK, whatever I was doing, forget about it, just pass it, it, pass pass it back along. up to the yep. callback. Uh, whatever else I'm going to do is going to probably break. And then when I get the response, I'm just calling res.sendResponse. And actually, I like um, want to do the same thing if I get an error, errors, call next. return next error. Yep. So if I get the list of packages, there we go. Uh, let's take this one, Bluebird, because promises are cute and fun. If we go contributors slash Bluebird, I should get the list of all of the contributors. Awesome. And what I'm getting here is all the data that, I'm, that I can be pulled down from the GitHub API. So you can see for this list of contributors, I'm getting uh, Gabriel F. I get his ID, an avatar Tons. URL, and you know a bunch of URLs for uh, API endpoints where I can get more information sure. about that yep. user. It's pretty great. So really, in just a little bit of time, we've been able to construct now a pretty rich backend that's offering up a data model which allows us to span both NPM as well as the GitHub information associated with that. Yep. So I think the next step here is let's connect that into the API that mean, to the user u interface. Your users aren't just using curl and yeah, I know. JSON. It's well, I think it'd be nice to have a little <laughs> web page. And then what we could do is we can always package that up in different ways. Sure. So why don't you check that in? Yep. And then we'll pull it over to my machine, and we'll go make that quick change. What drew you to server-side development? I was actually doing full stack development before there was a word for it on a Microsoft stack with VB script on both client and server. Cool, gotta love that. Yeah, and I, I really love the kind of community and the flexibility around open source software development, but uh, using different languages on the front and back was really annoying uh, to me. So you were at Yahoo when you were doing this and then yep. Node came out. Right, right, and I mean that really kind of catalyzed everything and kicked off this whole server side JavaScript movement because everybody was moving in the same direction. And what makes Node so well suited for building backends? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, first, I mean, um, it's real easy to get something that works and spin it up quickly. And then you can always split it up into different services that talk to each other over HTTP if you need to scale out different parts independently. Um, second thing is just using the same language on the front and back end makes it real easy to move logic around and kind of have more flexibility. And the third is that there's this huge community of people oh, yeah. publishing everything that you can imagine to NPM. Yeah, whenever I'm looking for code, I can find it out there. And I think the thing that's really exciting about this is once you've got the application up and running and you've used Node, now you have a lot of flexibility about how you might split it into other pieces, independently scale it out, and you know, if you discover a need for another kind of implementation, you could always do that too. Yeah, I mean, one of the beauties of a, a service-oriented architecture is as long as everything's uh, talking to each other over HTTP, it doesn't matter what any of the individual services are made of. Well, let's look at some code. Great. What I've done here, actually, uh, while you were 
doing the client side stuff. I've added a little bit to our server so that it's it's using the uh, the FS module. It's yes. a thing we don't have to npm install that because it's built into Node. And then because this is happening at startup time, it's not in a route. I'm going to go ahead and just use synchronous I/O because it's at start time, so yep. it's totally fine to do that. Uh, to pull in the two files that we need in order to get our client side running, the client.js and decoded.html. Anytime you make a request to forward slash, I want to serve the decoded.html file as uh, text.html. And the way that I've done this, it doesn't have to read the file every change because it's not going to change every time. Um, and every time you request slash client.js. Send back application JavaScript as the client. Looks yep. good. And so now when we start, we can see when we uh, curl client.js, I'm getting all of that JavaScript that you wrote and checked in. And uh, when I serve just that, I get the HTML. HTML, great. So just to quickly look at what we've got over here, um, I went through and really just very simply went and fetched the packages um, using a standard AJAX call and then did a little bit of rewriting on the tables that were in there being managed by Bootstrap. So I think the thing to do is let's just take a look at the, the app now running. And the easiest way to do that, we'll just open up a browser. And let me start that up. And we'll use the npm start command that we created. It's building. And there we go. The TypeScript compiler is compiling your client side TypeScript as well as server side right now, right? Uh, it is, but in this particular case, we're not particularly worried about kind of different module sure, types, but sure. it all happens to be working. Yes, and it's created the, the client JavaScript. And let's take a quick look at that now operating. So here I'll open up Chrome. And uh, we were looking at this in Internet Explorer before. Obviously, these things work in any of them. As Isaac showed, if we go to 3000, um, we get the HTML. And one of the cool things we can do now is we can pick one of these hot uh, NPM projects, and we can see who's been contributing. Got a favorite? Uh, let's use Bluebird. Why not? There we go. Most popular promised library named after a bird. All right. Well, so that's a quick wrap up of how we can use Node NPM to provide us with an incredible set of tools. We've created a pretty sophisticated backend that provides the data model, and then we've hooked it up to one of these responsive user interfaces. And as you can see, if we kind of shrink this thing down, uh, just like we saw last time with, uh, with Bootstrap, it will automatically start factoring this and giving us nice layouts on narrow devices or on mobile devices. All right, so as you can see, we've pulled together an amazing backend that's got a rich data model. We've connected it up to a responsive user interface, and we put together a pretty interesting app. So I thought that was fun. Yeah, it was good. Didn't even have to write most of the code. Yeah, so cheers. Thanks. The JavaScript community is really near and dear to my heart, and so it's been exciting to run a company in line with my values about what it means to be a good open source citizen. We're building tools that JavaScript developers are using around the world in order to make their lives easier, in order to get more done and have encounter less friction in the process. People are building new interesting stuff and connecting up their programs in all of these tiny little modules that can just be snapped together to build really interesting stuff. I can't wait to see what you build next. Creating great artwork and creating great code all requires the mastery of basic skills. As we've talked about today, Node.js is a fantastic master recipe that you can use to start creating the back ends of your system. A common language, the largest ecosystem in the world, really empowers you to do amazing things. I'm John Shuchuk, and the canvas is yours. Stay tuned as we dive into DevOps. We'll share the best practices and continue the conversations with the industry's key players. Next time on Decoded. To find the code for this episode, go to the decoded GitHub repo.